Emmanuel, help your church to seek your holy face. Emmanuel, Emmanuel. I'd like us to sing that song with the whole of our hearts. Emmanuel. We are calling on the Lord this morning because He is a king over this kingdom. Calling your name. Emmanuel. We will you come
seeing the Lord, seeing the face of the Lord is, is a deliverance. If the Lord can cause us to behold his face, to see his face as it really is, it's a deliverance. There is a level of knowledge, level of understanding and wisdom that can only come when we behold the face of God. There are things that have tied us down, things we have struggled with that do not have any other choice but to be destroyed when we see the face of the Lord. Our prayer this morning that even as we go into the world briefly, the Lord will cause us to see his face. He will cause us to behold his face that every veil upon the heart of man will be tear, it will be torn in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we ask that you help us. Help us to see your holy face. Help us to see your face, Lord, in the name of Jesus. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated in the house of God this morning. Amen. The Lord has led us along this line of revelation in the past um, weeks and we're still going to continue with it because there is a work that God is doing that we are trusting that our yieldedness would allow him to take it to the destination he has in mind. We have been talking about the kingdom of God and all that it entails. Today we'll be looking at another aspect of that vast um, economy of God, the kingdom of God. Amen. I'll be reading from Jeremiah chapter 10, and I'd like you to listen to hear me with your heart and your spirit. I'll be reading from verse 1 to the end of the chapter. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the Eden, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. For, the cutted, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, and the work of the hands of the workman with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright in the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great and thy name is great in might. We would not fear thee, O king of nations, for to thee doth it appertain, for as much as amongst all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdom there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread upon plate is brought from Tashish, and gold from Ufaz, the work of the workman. And the hands of the founder, blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men. Verse 10 says, <clears throat> But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble, and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. And he says, Thus says Ye unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He had made the earth by his power, he had established the world by his wisdom, and had stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttered his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he caused the vapors to ascend from the hands of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasuries. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood and there is no breath in them. They are vanity and the work of errors. 
In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them. He is, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Gather up thy wares out of the land, O inhabitant of the fortress. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at these ones, and will distress them, and they may, not, they may find it so. Woe is me for my heart. My wound is grievous. But I said, truly, this is grief, and I must bear it. My tabernacle is palled, and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me, and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore, and to set up my curtains. For the pastors have become brutish, and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the bruit is come, and a great commotion out of the north country. To make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walk to direct his steps. O oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him and consumed him and have made his habitation desolate. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're going to be trusting the Lord to begin to open our eyes to this understanding. The kingdom of God is, like we have been told and we have been taught, is a domain where the authority of God is exalted and established. It is a place where God has sovereign rule and it can decide what be and what be not. And as believers, we are fortunate to be a critical part of that kingdom. And God, in his sovereign will, has given us this side of his kingdom to reign over. And there is a mindset and an understanding we need to have for us to that, that kingdom to find expression here. You know, we, in our personal experiences, we might have had situations and challenges that are proving very difficult to be handled. And we may, just like what we saw in the drama here, there are things in our past that may begin to, you know, show up and seep into the future, into our present, and begin to try to draw us back into the things we believe that God has taken us out of. Amen. But there is an understanding we need to have as believers that we are going to look at from this portion of scripture. If you check from the beginning, the scripture says, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Israel. It was talking about not learning the ways of the hidden. And the ways of the hidden and having to learn it and begin to live it what it means to us is that we are relinquishing the authority that God has given us even to the enemy. When we begin to practice all the principles and all the ideas and all the ways of the enemy, we are more or less living and um, relinquishing our authority that God has given us unto him. But it is important that as much as that may be the case for us in the past, there is a new reality that we are living in now. And there shouldn't be a time for us as believers that we should forget about that reality, irrespective of what the circumstances is. My major um, emphasis from this chapter of scripture, um, from this chapter, is in verse 10. The scripture says, Thus, says, Thus shall ye say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth. Even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. That is the judgment of God proclaimed upon the whatever power that is at work in this world that is not of God. Whatever influence, whatever power, no matter how high ranking that power is, there is already a verdict and a judgment from God that is against them. It says... 
as long as any of this deity, any of this God, any of this power, any of this influence didn't contribute to the creation of the earth, as long as there is no impute from them to God, there is no knowledge that they borrowed God, there is no intelligence that they gave to God or support that they gave to God when he was putting together the heaven and the earth and the principle that guides the operation of the earth, they shall perish. We saw how that um, Jeremiah was explaining the nature of these gods. He says they are the handwork of men. They are plated with silver and plated with gold. And the reality, in truth, their reality is nothing. Their reality is nothing. And that's looking at it on, on, um, on the surface. We can begin to contextualize it to our own time and season. You know, many times there, there are devices that we have made for ourselves. There are wisdom that we have crafted for ourselves that we believe can help us maneuver the challenges of life. We, even though we have submitted our will to God, submitted our, our, our will to God, so to speak, but there are also devices that we have crafted, that we have created, that, that are more like idols, that we believe are going to help us to overcome life's challenges. Probably because we feel that, okay, God, God is not as fast as I want him to be. Then we have decided to craft another way for ourselves. We have decided to create an, an idol of our own making to satisfy a longing that we have on our inside. And that's the first place we need to start from. You know, we are, our nature as human is that we we'll definitely have longings. We will definitely have desires. We will definitely have things that we want to achieve. We have, in fact, we have legitimate needs. And many times when we begin to deal with God and relate with God, it appears as if God is not mindful of those needs, is not mindful of those desires and those longings that we have. And if God does not help us, if we are not submitted and broken to the core, there is a possibility that we will begin to have God by the way, you know, just have him by the side, walking with him. And then by this other side, we are crafting our own way to manage God and manage the fulfillment of our desires. And I, like I said again, some of these desires are legitimate desires. But there is a place we need to come to as people that are um, subject to God. There is an understanding we need to have. That the will of God is perfect at every time. The will of God is perfect at every time. It may not look like it in the meantime. It may be, it may be grievous. It may be very hard to bear. But the will of God is perfect at, very, at every point in time. And when we begin to devise and make ways for ourselves to maneuver the situations of life, to maneuver the challenges of life, those things we are building for ourselves, when we practice it for a while, they eventually master our soul and they have the capacity to drive us away from God. Amen. They have the capacity to drive us away from God. I would quickly, you know, dive, dive, um, dive um, um, what's the word now? Digress. Thank you. I will quickly digress into the story of um, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. We know how that um, because of the iniquity of David and then um, the lack of um, the ways of Solomon, how that he began to follow other gods, God eventually gave a decree that the kingdom was going to be divided during the time of his descendants. And we saw from scripture that the kingdom of, um, the, the kingdom of Israel, that was a united kingdom at that point, became divided we now have 10 tribes coming together to form Israel, and then two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, coming together to form Judah. And we saw the general, um, Rehoboam, and um, how he, God chose him and decided to elevate him and make him king over the 10 tribes of, that make up Judah. Amen. And a time came, I would like us to open to the scripture so that we can get the, 
right context. That's First King chapter twelve. First Kings chapter twelve. <clears throat> Okay, um, Okay. I think I will be reading from verse, I'll be reading from, okay, that should be verse 16, yes, verse 16. Okay, no, that's, it's not verse 16. I'm looking for the part where, okay, yes, verse 26, not 16, verse 26. So, um, verse 26 says that, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David, if these people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then shall the heart of these people turn again unto the Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. In, in this particular scenario, um, Jeroboam was reigning over the ten tribe of Judah, and then eventually the place of worship for the entire nation of Israel before that time was in Judah. Okay, I said Judah, sorry, Israel. The place of worship was in Judah. And then when the division came, the people had one God and they had a devotion to, to Jehovah. And it would mean that they would have to travel from Israel to Judah to worship. And then the king began to think in his heart that, okay, I am a king in my territory and my people are going to another nation that I have severed myself from, that we are even having a power tussle to go and worship. And he began to think that a time will come because they, they will continually go there to worship that their heart will be drawn towards the king of Judah and they will kill him and then the kingdom will be united again. And the wisdom that came to him to resolve the matter is that he's going to make golden calves for, him, for the people to begin to worship and instructs them not to go to Judah to worship. Amen. And... You can imagine this kind of thought. This is a man that was helped by God. He was single-handedly chosen by God, not because he had a link to the royal family or because he was worthy to take that position. But God single-handedly picked him and the grace of God found him and he made him king without any device of his own doing. There was nothing he did. There was nothing crafty or nothing... Um, no wisdom that he employed for him to be chosen by God. And then when he got to that point, he felt that the people were going to desert him because they would continually go to Judah to worship. And then he created a golden calf and instituted idolatry in Israel. And this, has exam this is an example of ways that we sometimes devise means for ourselves to get our desires fulfilled. And it's important that we note this and we are careful because every one of us, we are susceptible to make this kind of error. God, God's way is a way that must be followed through and through. In the same um, Jeremiah chapter 10 that we were reading earlier, we we'll see there also that the scripture says that that should be verse, verse 23. He says, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, and it is not in man that walketh to direct his step. O oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine hunger, lest thou bring me to nothing. So verse 23 says, the way of a man is not in himself, and it is not in man that walk to direct his own step. And this is where we are meant to start from as people who are meant to bear rule in the kingdom of God. There is an agreement that has to be established in us. There is a, we must be one. Yes, I think that's the best way to put it. We must be one. 
And this is what I mean by we must be one. We must be one spirit, soul, and body. Because Jesus was telling um, the Pharisees in, um, in the book of Matthew that a kingdom that is divided against itself shall not stand. And then for us as individuals, we must be one. Spirit, soul, and body. There is a move of God on your spirit that must find its way into your soul and be expressed in your body and by the things that you do. There must be that oneness in us as an individual, even personally, for us to be able to um, be effective in this kingdom and be able to achieve the result that God has for us. Our soul, our spirit cannot be at war with each other and alongside with our body, and then they would expect that we will be productive as people in the kingdom. We, it cannot happen like that. God, at the point of salvation, has been able to transform, more or less exchange, and, you know, rebirth our spirit. And there is a unity, an understanding that is between the spirit of God and the recreated spirit of every believer. And this agreement must also be, trans, must be, trans, must be um, transferred to the soul and the body. And this is one of the greatest battles that we will fight as members of the kingdom. It is actually an inward battle that we will continue to fight so that the kingdom of God will find expression here on earth. The, the level to which we are being able to conquer in this battle will determine how much of the kingdom of God will make beer on earth. So the battle is, first of all, an inward battle. For example, we saw in the case of um, the king of Judah, how that the battle started as a thought in his heart. He began to think that as these people will go to um, Judah to, to worship, and they would be interfacing with the king of Judah, there is a possibility that their heart will be drawn back to him. And that was where the battle came from. It was a whispering from darkness that came to his soul. And he is not able to manage and deal with that whisper very well. And then the whisper came along with a wisdom to solve the problem. A wisdom of darkness to solve the problem. And the wisdom was for him to begin to create idol for the people to worship within the territories of his land, and they wouldn't have need to go to Judah. And for many of us, that is the beginning of the battle. We face difficulties, we face challenges, but then there is a whisper that comes. There is a whisper that comes, giving us seemingly brilliant solution, fast and quick solution to deal with the case. But the way, the way of a man is actually not in himself. And it is not in man that walk to direct his own step. If you check the pages of scripture, you will see examples of things like this over and over again. Amen. We will see examples of things like this over and over again. God giving an instruction and then man is in a very difficult situation and a contrary idea, a contrary solution, a contrary idea to the instruction that God gave came as the solution to that problem. So this is a battle we would have to fight every day and every time. And we need to begin to trust the Lord for the grace and the wisdom to be able to overcome. And that's the, that's the foundation, that's like the primary battle that must be fought. Also, we will look at um, the example I cited, the, the nation of, the, at the point where the nation of Israel was divided, we saw that prior to that time, their journey from, um, from Egypt, the, the travail in the wilderness, and the, the grace of God that they enjoyed in entering the promised land, and the establishment that God gave them. God had to drive away nations that were stronger, nations that were larger in number, nations that had, had more, um, more um, 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 was, um, sorry, nations that had more, um, more capacity in terms of warfare than them. Amen. So nations like these were nations that God took away out of the sin and he established them in the land of Canaan. 
And they enjoyed a season of peace when they were in agreement with the will and the purpose of God. But their doom came when they began to disobey the instructions of God. And as much as their doom came, their doom was sealed and established at the point when they were divided. Amen. The level of idolatry, the level of um, sacrilege that Israel went, to, went into from the point where the nation was divided was, was so enormous. Was so enormous. And some of it were, they, they actually happened because there was a division. For example, I do not believe that um, the king of Israel would have thought in his heart to create golden calves if the nations were together and everybody can easily go and worship God. So the, 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 at the point where their destruction was established was the point where they were divided. And it, it brings to us the importance of oneness as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. You know, we had spoken about personally, inwardly as a person, that oneness that must be in existence for the kingdom of God to be fully expressed through us. Then for us as a corporate body, as a corporate congregation, it is also important for us to be together and one for that kingdom of God to find full expression. Amen. There is, much that, there is not much that God can do with a people or a kingdom that is divided. There is not much that God can do for such a people. In fact, there is not much that God can do against a kingdom that is united. And we can see that from scripture. There is not much that God can do against a kingdom that is divided. God will have to first of all find a way to bring a division before he can thwart whatever um, demonic idea they are trying to propagate. Um, in the book of Genesis chapter 11, um, during the time, chapter 11 or chapter 6, during the time of the building of the um, Tower of Babel, we saw that it was clearly stated that there was nothing God could have done because these people are one. These people have that oneness. So it is important for us to be aware of these things. These are more, they are subtle things that the enemy use to, you know, have its way in our means. So first of all, we need to check ourselves. We need to check inwardly. There is that unity of, 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 of yourself as an individual that must be achieved. That oneness between your spirit, your soul, and your body for the kingdom of God to find full expression in you. And then for us as a corporate body, we can maintain the plan of God, we can maintain the purpose of God, we can maintain the worship of God in our midst if we can maintain the oneness of spirit. And this is why it is important. The way God has created his congregation, he has created it such that he has deposited things that are needed by the entire congregation into several members of the congregation. We saw Paul giving an example of the body of Christ using the human body. And he spoke categorically in scripture that every part has its own function. Every part has its own um, usefulness. That there is no way the body can function maximally without the the two, without all the parts being together. Amen. So it's, it's very important for us to note this, that that oneness must be achieved for the kingdom of God to find um, all the expression that is needed in our midst. Um, the worship of God is at the center of the kingdom of God. The worship of God is at the center of the kingdom of God. And it's more like the pivot that the kingdom of God rests upon. And anything, any little thing that tamper with that pivot of worship, then the kingdom is going to be dismantled. It's a very delicate balance that we must be careful to, to keep. Anything that shifts the worship of God off its balance, then the kingdom of God will no longer be effective, will no longer find 
full expression in that place. And just like we have said before now, during the time when the worship of God in the, in the nation of Israel was tampered with, then the kingdom of God that was established on earth through the nation of Israel was dismantled. Worship was touched and then the kingdom of God no longer found expression. The people that were supposed to bear the nature of God, that were supposed to bear the spirit of God, the oracle of God, and then that were supposed to give a statement about the person of God to the entire human race, to the entire human race that were in existence at that point, no longer had that voice. In fact, at the peak of it, the very object that signifies the presence of God in their, in their midst was taken away. So at the point where worship was tampered with, the kingdom was no longer in place. And that's one thing we need to take note of. And like I said, one of the things that tamper with worship is the distraction that we have. The wisdom, the human wisdom that we begin to engage to solve the problems and the challenges that come to us. Amen. So this is the worship of God. It is the worship of God that sustains the kingdom of God. And any time there is a division in the kingdom, it will definitely lead to the compromise of the worship of God. So if that pivot of worship is tampered with, then the entire system will lose its balance. Amen. So, and there are both private altars and corporate altars in the kingdom of God. And both private altars and, corporate, and the corporate altars are needed for the smooth functioning of the kingdom. I've said this um, somehow before, but I'll further explain. In this kingdom, we have both private altars and corporate altars. The private altars particularly talks about our personal um, secret devotion to the Lord just between ourselves and the Lord. And it's a private thing that you, most times happen in the closet of our hearts and in the closet of our room between ourselves and God. And for the kingdom of God to be to be functional, that must be in place. And that's why there is a need to be a cooperation between our spirit, our soul, and in our bodies. Because as long as we are here, there are going to be darts of thoughts, darts of ideas that will be shot into our hearts by the darkness in this world. We will never, we will, there, there is never a time that we are going to outgrow that um, work of darkness. Those darts, those, those darts of thoughts, darts of ideas are going to be shot into our hearts and many times they look like ideas that are original to you. You will think, this is what I'm thinking, but as a matter of fact, it is not your thought. It is a thought that has been fired into you by darkness. And if we are not intelligent enough to confront, to pull down, to tame and to destabilize that thought by the word of God, as long as we begin to give room to it, as long as we begin to allow it to foster, it is going to arch and find expression. It's more like when you put an egg into an incubator and you don't need to do anything. Just allow the egg to be in the incubator and just be there. And because our heart has the capacity to arch thoughts, and the important thing is that you don't allow it to first to foster in your heart. But if you allow it to foster and you think nothing will happen, it's just there. I'm just thinking it. It's just there in my heart. I'm not, it's not as if I want to do it. I'm just thinking about it. You have you are already given it power to gain root into your heart. So it's important that as we engage the world and the darts of evil thought and the dart of demonic wisdom is being shot into our heart, we are wise enough to counter it immediately with the knowledge of God. Casting down every high thing, every imagination and thought that is exalting itself against the knowledge of God. So this is a wisdom we need to begin to employ to manage that kind of situation. And basically, this 
that what they are trying to aim is the place of our worship, the altar of our worship, the altar of our worship. Is either that they find a way to deny you entrance into the place of worship or they make you a kind of person that is not fit for worship. So there are two things they would want to achieve. Is it that they, they, they make the door, they, they put you in such a, in a state where you will not be able to enter into the place of worship or they make you a person that is not fit to stand in the place of worship. So these are things that these, these um, attacks of darkness against us individually tries to achieve. And when that is achieved, the kingdom of God that is meant to find expression through our lives, through our dealings with one another, will be compromised. Amen. And when we talk about the corporate altar, which is needed for the effective functioning of the kingdom of God, it talks about our togetherness, our, to, our worship together, more or less what we are doing today. Anytime we come together in a corporate atmosphere, praying together as a team, praying together as a congregation, we are more or less in that corporate altar, burning incense and making sacrifices. Amen. And when each and every one of us begin to come with our high term of sacrifice, that we have been able to, that we have, um, that we have to give to the Lord, and we make such sacrifice, it will not be accounted to just the person that made the sacrifice. It will, it will be accounted to the corporate body because it is a corporate altar. And this is to tell us that the impute of every one of us on the corporate altar is very important. That as you come with your own sacrifice, as you, as you come with your own incense and you burn it on the corporate altar, it will not just be accounted to you as an act of worship, but it will be accounted to the entire congregation corporately as an act of worship. So we have to be very careful that we guard that unity so that that place of corporate worship and corporate altar is not comp compromised. And we need this for the kingdom of God to find full expression in our midst. We need all of this for the kingdom of God to find full expression in our midst. Amen. Praise the Lord. So there are key items um, for our corporate worship that God has placed in the vessels of some members of the congregation. And if such people are separated from the congregation, our corporate worship may suffer. There are key items. If you check even in the New Testament, in the Holy Church, we had teachers and we had prophets that were significant people needed for the growth and the, function, the, the effective functioning of the church in that day. And you can imagine when a congregation lacks the ministry of a prophet or a congregation lacks the ministry of a teacher. And God puts graces in the lives of people because he has his congregation in mind. And that's why for you as an individual, irrespective of the gift and the capacity that God has given you, no matter how great and how um, um, magnificent is it, it is, you need to understand that it is useless outside of the body. All of these things are meant for the building up, for the edification of the body of Christ. And he puts us in a place where we are to place a burden of the maintenance of unity upon ourselves. It's a burden, actually. It's a burden. A burden that that bond, that oneness that must be sustained for the corporate body of Christ is not broken from my own end. We have to carry that burden. It's part of the cross that we are meant to carry. Because irrespective of what God has given you individually, he has given you because of the corporate body. And I need you to note that word, because. He has given you because of the corporate body. And when we begin to relate 
with ourselves in the place of worship, that has to be the mindset we are relating from. That has to be the mindset we are relating from. Practically in our own um, immediate congregation here, many of us, has, we have been blessed by the giftings that God has placed in the life of many other persons here. There are men and women that God has gifted with um, virtues that is necessary to keep the, his body. And it's important for us to have that mindset that the body of unity, the body of oneness, should be upon every one of us. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So we, to forge, forge ahead, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 54 verse 14. And this is to further explain a part of the kingdom that um, we started with. It's a very popular scripture that says, No weapon that is formed against you shall be able to prosper, and every tongue that rises up against you in judgment you shall condemn. And a, a very critical question came to my mind while I read this scripture not too long ago. And what does it mean when scripture said that every tongue that rises up against you in judgment you shall condemn. You know, many times we, we read a passage of scripture and we just quote it and believe that it is effective. But you know, sometimes it's not just about quoting it. Quoting it may mean that you need to do something. So the question that popped up in my, in my heart is, what does, what does it mean to condemn every tongue that rises up against you in judgment? Because scripture says you, you are to condemn it. So is it just by saying, oh thoughts, I condemn you. Like, oh thoughts, I condemn you. Amen. But if you, if you read that passage very well, this, it, it gives an idea of what happens in a court of law. When a criminal that has committed an offense is brought before the judge and then the advocates began to put forth all the evidences that they, had, they have for and against. And then at the end of all the um, back and forth in the court of law, the judge proclaims a verdict. And most times, if the court system is a good one, most times the criminal ends up being condemned. And that's the idea that is captured in that scripture that says, Every thought that rises up against you in judgment, you shall condemn. It brings an idea of you taking that thought into the court of heaven and then beseeching the God of all the earth, the judge of all the earth, rather, to place a judgment based on all the evidences that you have against that thought. Amen. So that's the idea it brings forth. God has said that you are the head and not the tail, for example. And then there are thoughts coming to your heart saying that definitely you are going to fail. Can't you see your mother didn't finish secondary school? Your father didn't finish? Your elder brother did not finish? So what makes you think that you even go to the university and finish? And that, that's like a thought. And then you bring that kind of thought to the court of heaven and... You begin to, you know, deal with God and say, no, this is contrary to what you have said in your word concerning me. And then you demand for a verdict from the court of law against that thought. And that's when a verdict is now proclaimed against the thought, then the thought is condemned. So it's like a process in the court of law. And all of these things are things that happen when we pray. And this, I said this to further explain um, where I started from. That are, there are critical things in the kingdom that we need to have an understanding for of. And until we have that understanding, we may not be able to effectively um, function. And many of us, because we are not very skilled and wise in engaging God and getting answers, we have had to devise ways and means to get our problems solved by ourselves. 
I'm, I believe you are beginning to see the link between what, what all I've been saying. So, there are, because we do not really understand how to approach God, get answers from God for the things that he has promised us, then we decide to look for an alternative. And when we look for an alternative, we are deviating from the kingdom. We are making redundant the power that is meant to be available in the kingdom. So it's important that we take note of these things and we, we understand the way God works. Amen. So every tongue that rises up against us in judgment, we are meant to condemn. We are meant to bring them before God and ensure and begin to plead that God brings a verdict or the verdict that is already in existence is enacted immediately against that um, thought. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, a kingdom that is divided against itself shall not stand. That's the crux of what we are here today to learn. That is what the God wants to open our eyes to. And there are diverse ways. There are diverse ways that this is applicable. There are diverse ways. We have the personal division that can happen to a man with himself. I've seen people that are even doubting the power of God, the grace of God, and the gifting of God in their lives. They have seen visions. They have seen dreams. They have been given prophecies about what God wants to do with their lives. But they are not able to bring themselves to a place where they can believe that word and begin to run with it. There is a lot of doubt. There is a lot of anxiety. A lot of, a lot of unbelief because of who they think they are. Because of who they think they are. And they are not able to come to a place where they can believe the word of God spoken concerning them. And until we come to that point where we can believe God's words that is spoken personally concerning us, we will not be able to, to work it out. We will not be able to work it out. It finds expression in different dimensions. The example from the drama, people who God has saved from their sins and because of the memories that haunt them, they still find it very difficult to believe that God has done that work. People that God has called to be great evangelists and great teachers. And because of their present condition, because of the way that their up upbringing has damaged them, they can't believe, they, they can't bring themselves to believe that they can be used of God along that line. And this is a critical battle that every one of us must fight. And, and we, are to, we are meant to fight it not just because um, you... You, you, need to be, uh, if you need to be recognized as someone who is doing something for God. No. We are meant to fight it because the corporate body of God, the corporate body of God needs what God has deposited in you for it to be, um, for it to function maximally. Amen. So, one of the things we'll be trusting the Lord to deal with even as we as um, we bring the service, before the service comes to an end, is that for as many of us who have been trapped in that place of doubt, in that place of unbelief for one reason or the other, that we have a difficulty in having in getting to that oneness of spirit, soul, and body that is needed for effectiveness, that God will begin to bring down every wall of barrier. That that oneness will be achieved personally in us in the mighty name of Jesus. So it's important that we, we, <clears throat> we stay, we, we strive, yes, we strive to achieve that oneness. Like I said, it's a battle that we will continue to fight. And the grace of God is ever present to help us even in the seasons of this battle. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, finally, I'd like us to, to read um, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. Sorry, verse 14, verse 11. Verse 11, 
because while we while the um, service was going on, I perceived strongly that the Lord will have us pray along that line. There is the power of God to break demonic strongholds, to break, and the kind of demonic strongholds I'm talking about are influences, are influences that keep people bound, influences that keep people bound, that do not want them to, you know, achieve the fullness of the purpose of God for their lives. He says, thus shall you say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. This is more like a verdict. It's more like a condemnation that is brought to the gods. It's more like a verdict from God. He says, thus shall you say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under this heaven. I'd like you to rise up this morning, even as we pray. There are influences, and I need us to listen. There are influences that is manipulating our realities. Some of these things, they are, they are things that are deeply rooted into our foundations, deeply rooted into the generations before us, and it has find, they found a way to travel, and it, has, it is still affecting our possibilities now. But the scripture here says that thus shall you say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. We we'll lift up our voice this morning, and we are going to be decreeing this verdict of the Lord against the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth. He says they shall perish from the head and from under these heavens. There is an aspect of the head that God has given unto you. Your life is a section, an aspect of the earth that God has given unto you. Your family is a section of the head that God has given unto you. And you have the legal right to proclaim the judgment of God upon any God or any influence that is manipulating circumstances within that context. We are lifting our voices. We are asking that they shall perish. They shall perish. As the scripture says, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, they shall come to their perish in the name of Jesus. As it is written, thus says the Lord, thus shall you say unto them, we are speaking forth unto them, that every situation, every influence that is negatively manipulating my immediate life, that is negatively manipulating my family, the only ground they have to stay is if they have created any member of my family. The only ground that they have to stay is if they have created any part of my body. The only, the only ground they have to stay is if they have created any organ in your body. For some of us that are having any issue with our organ, and it's a demonic manipulation, the only ground that that manipulation has even to continue to, perp to perpetuate itself is if it's created that organ. If it has created your body, then it can stay. But this is the word of the Lord to us today. That thus shall you say unto the gods that has not made the heavens and the earth, that they shall perish from under the earth. We are lift up your voice and decree that they perish from your life. They perish from your family. The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth. Zaka shete beli baratane. Eze brendo saka pate vilo breke petove. Jakataka brande filataya. Azimbro seka pantove li baratade. Zaka patebo zebrande ketedia. They shall perish from under these heavens. They shall perish from under these heavens. From under these heavens. Along with your negative influence. Along with your manipulation. Along with the oppression of witchcraft that is through them. They shall perish. Kapote beletano. Zabrande kete kaparia shatade. Eze brendo saka patano. Ezi brende kaparia shabrendo veletaya. Zaka pate brendi varataya. 
the God that have not made any organ in my body that is causing it to be sick that is causing it to be sick they shall perish they perish right now in the name of Jesus the verdict of God the judgment of God comes upon every God that is reigning as God but has not created me but has not created any member of my family Zapote, Kapande, Ezembre, Ziva Rataya, Azimbro, Saka, Patabilo, Ebres, Kaparatande, Siga, Dayata, Shabarata, Melo, Berataya, Ezebrende, Fekete, Kobeli, Atai, Ziatai, 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 Kabai, Zepe, Kapashate, Ebrendo, Saka, Pariata, Lataya, any God that has not made, that has not made me, that has not made me, that has not created or formed a purpose for me that is manipulating my life manipulating oh my situations kapante beria takaya i bring on you today the verdict of heaven zaparia takatane zebrendo kaparia tabaliande i bring on you the verdict of heaven the verdict of heaven says that you shall perish and i decree now perish I decree now perish. I decree now perish. I decree now perish. Kapale Purate. Every influence that is slowing me down. Every influence that is slowing me down. It is not of God. It is not ordained of God. This is a verdict of the Lord. Perish. Kapale Purazelia. Zebrende Feria Kapatande. Every thought that is making me doubt the purpose of God for my life. Every thought that is making me doubt the promise of God for my life. This is the verdict of the Lord. Perish. Kaparia Shate. Ere Pereso. Brenda Fila Paria. This is the verdict of the Lord. I come today with the verdict of the Lord. I come today with the verdict of the Lord. Perish. Kaparia Shate. Ezembre kefelo zeri atane Ezi barato pekatande Ekariata palia Berule ketane I come today with the verdict of the Lord Perish Kaparate pelete Kapona taparatada Rapala kapande zia I come today with the verdict of the Lord Perish I come today with the verdict of the Lord. Every God, every deity that has not created you, that is manipulating you, their influence perish. Their influence perish. Kapore Setenu, Arabada Brande Keshetai, Zebrendo Kapra Kaparia Tada, Arabala Brando Sobre Kaparia. Aruza Pande Katakombe Riata Labrashaka Shaka 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 Kaparo Setaria Zabareto Periata Bella For in Jesus' name we pray. I would like us to address unbelief. I like us to address unbelief. There are people here that what is holding you bound is the fact that you can't bring yourself to believe. Sometimes you even doubt whether you are saved. You can't be, bring yourself to believe what the Lord has said. And it's, it's, it's an influence that is trying to, it's, it's like a rope tied to your leg and tied to something. And no matter how you strive, no matter how you try to break out, you are not able to break out. But there is a verdict from the Lord today that we have, we have, we have secured. It says the God that have not made the heavens and the earth that are exerting influence, they shall perish. We are exerting, we are, we are making that decree today that every, every influence that is drawing you back, that is causing you not to believe, every influence that is causing you not to believe. Kapo se tedi atabarato. Zebrende keshi kapata mela. Rate ke zibare zalita barade. Ezembro barato pre kapandedia. Opa kapa kaparatai. Zabrande kaparia shatai. Ezebrendo sobrat 
Kaparia, Zebrandia Nila Rosia, Maria Kaparia. You are meant to find the battle of faith. Son of the God. battle of faith can only be fought when you believe. I believe. The battle of faith can only be fought when you believe. I believe. Every influence that is causing you not to believe, we pull them down today in the name of Jesus. Every influence causing you not the to believe, pull them down today in the name of Jesus. I believe. Zabranda kete koberiata. I believe. Shala parata kai. Kabra la barata. Zabranda kata bila haya. Zoria, Zoria, Zoria. Zoria, Zoria. Oh. Kapakata kopekai. Zetia, Zetia. Zina said it. We did not do it. God is not a man that he will lie. He is not a son of man that he will repent. So Prakia, Pagombe, Erilo, Satai, Kapara Shatatani, Ebrando Sekoperiata. He is not a son of man that he will lie. He is God. He is God. He is not a son of man that he should lie. Zari poroto belatai kaparate. Shebene kabore atamina leva rakombra de kavana soy kumara. Finally, if you're here this morning and you are sick in your body in any way, in any form, I'd like you to place your hand on your head or place your hand on your stomach. Whatever ailment, whatever sickness, whatever terminal disease that has perpetuated because of the influence of a demon, it comes to an end today. There is a verdict from the Lord that says that they shall perish. So we are dec I'm decreeing today that their influence perish. Their influence perish. Every terminal disease that is affecting any organ, it comes to an end today in the name of Jesus. Every demonic influence, demonic orchestrated disease, they come to an end today in the name of Jesus. I cut, I cut off the influence of, it, of the demon. I cut it off. I cut it off. I cut it off in the name of Jesus. I cut it off in the name of Jesus. I cut it off in the name of Jesus. The word of the Lord says that health is your, is your, is your portion. Healing is your portion. Healing is your portion. From now henceforth, you begin to walk in it. You begin to walk in it. You begin to walk in it. The doorway of health is opened unto you. 
The doorway of health is open unto you. The doorway of health is open unto you. The hand of the Lord rests mightily upon you. And every demonic influence is cut off. It is cut off. For as many that are doubting in their heart, doubting the plan of God, doubting the word of God, doubting the integrity of God, doubting the purpose of God, I come against that demonic influence. In the name of Jesus, be gone. In the name of Jesus, be gone. Everything that is sitting on your heart, sitting on your heart, sitting, sitting on your heart, brooding on your heart, it is displaced right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Whatever is seated on your heart, brooding and transmitting unbelief, it is displaced right now in the name of Jesus. Your heart is healthy. Your soul is healthy. You can believe now. Yes. You can believe now. Faith is your Lord. Faith is your Lord. Is your Lord. In fact, you are a man of faith. You are a man of great faith. And by your hand, the Lord will do great and mighty things. It will be said, even in time to come, that the Lord wrought great and mighty things through your hand because of your faith in the Lord. For in Jesus' mighty name.